Well, tomorrow is Canada's National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. And we want to touch on this topic a little bit today, though we do it from Scripture for sure. Thursday, a few of us gathered for a short ceremony honoring the raising of the Okanagan Indian Band's flag over Vernon City Hall. You can see it there on the right, a permanent installation this year. Now on Thursday and Friday, across our city and, and, well, the whole province, across our country, students wore orange shirts in honor of Orange Shirt Day, and they went through some deeper understanding and teaching. The orange shirts in honor of Phyllis Webster and all students and all residential schools throughout our history who lost these students, children who lost not only the shirts off their back, like Phyllis did, but the hair off their heads, the language out of their mouths, sought to strip the culture from them, and many lost so much, much more. Now, we are encouraged to wear orange here today in our service. To take an orange ribbon, we have a bowl at the back. If you want to take that, maybe some people say, I don't have any orange. Well, there's definitely places that you could buy a shirt, but to at least wear a ribbon, especially going into tomorrow, to engage in this national day of commemoration, mourning, and remembrance. Now, though some would ask and have asked me, Pastor, Why are we talking about this in church? And why is our national organization, CBM, Canadian Baptist Ministries, inviting, empowering, resourcing every church in our family of churches across Canada to engage deeply in this task of truth and reconciliation? Isn't this just a political thing, Pastor? Can't we get back to the Bible? Leave that stuff for whatever, those that that care about it. Author, hereditary chief, and residential school survivor, Chief Robert Joseph, pictured here with Phyllis Webster, asked of my friend, Pastor Jody Sparger, our own Baptist leader in reconciliation, He asked her when they met, how is the Baptist church going to respond? Government knows they need to come to the table. Education knows. All these sectors know. But I want to know if the church knows. If the church doesn't show up, I have no hope for this process of reconciliation because it is primarily a spiritual task. Do we need to be told by indigenous leaders that we have a responsibility as a church here? Perhaps we do. However, we can also turn to Scripture to find an answer. Even in the story of David, which we have committed to studying for this year. Now, we are jumping ahead, way ahead, all the way to 2 Samuel 21. And what's interesting about these last few chapters of the story of David is that they're a unique group of stories compiled from a few other times throughout David's story. And the one we're looking at today takes place after David has become king. And that's a spoiler alert for some of you. Maybe if you didn't know that David becomes king because he just killed Goliath. And anyways, and after, even after Saul and Jonathan have died, these stories we'll look at. But we'll be exploring David's journey to the throne in the coming weeks and even exploits of Saul as well. But this story is one that we don't hear anywhere else except in this passage, 2 Samuel 21 the ramifications of Saul's actions and how David 
deals with it. It sets us up with the biblical theology and precedent for dealing with the actions of those who have gone on before us, even taking responsibility for their actions. So today we're going to read the story, pray, and then we're going to see what God has for us to learn how we can live it out today, and see what our family of churches, the CBWC, is doing. So I'm going to invite Hannah to come up and read our passage for us, and then we'll pray and enter in. Is this working? It's a bit of a tough passage, but... uh... Um, Join with me, I'm reading in 2 Samuel from chapter 21. During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years, and so David sought the face of the Lord. The Lord said, it is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. The king summoned the Gideonites and spoke to them. Now, the Gibeonites were not part of Israel, but were survivors of the Amorites. The Israelites had sworn to spare them, but Saul, in his zeal for Israel and Judah, had tried to annihilate them. David asked the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites answered him, we have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. What do you want me to do for you? David asked. They answered the king, As for the man who destroyed us and plotted against us so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel, let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed and their bodies exposed before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen one. So the king said, I will give them to you. The king spared Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath before the Lord between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. But the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, two sons of Aya's daughter, Rizpah, whom she had borne to Saul, together with the five sons of Saul's daughter, Merab, whom she had borne to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Maholathite. <laughs> he handed them over to the Gibeonites, and they killed them and exposed their bodies on a hill before the Lord. And all seven of them fell together, and they were put to death during the first days of harvest, just as the barley harvest was beginning. Rizpah, daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on the rock. From the beginning of harvest till the rain poured down from the heavens on the bodies, she did not let the birds touch them by day or the wild animals by night. When David was told what Aya's daughter Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had done, he went and he took the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from the citizens of Jabesh Gilead, and they had stolen their bodies from the public square at Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them after they struck Saul down on Gilboa. David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there, and the bones of those who had been killed and exposed, and they were gathered up. And they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the tomb of Saul's father Kish, Adzela, and Benjamin, and did everything the king commanded. And after that, God answered prayer on behalf of the land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask for your wisdom as we look at this hard story, that we would learn what you have for us from your word, your living in our hearts. Shape us and mold us and let us learn how to live it out in our day. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this story is pretty intense, isn't it? Our kids were in a play where they acted this out with music, and my my tears flowed. It shows how much God cares about justice, keeping our word, our integrity, and doing the right thing even when it hurts, 
and even when it wasn't us that did it. So this goes back to when the people of God came into the promised land. In Joshua 9, we read about the Gibeonites who were able to get a treaty. The Hebrew word is a covenant or a treaty with Joshua. Even though the Gibeonites actually tricked Joshua, if you look back at the story, Joshua honored the treaty that he made with them for peace. And that peace stayed for about 400 years until the days of Saul. This goes back 400 years. And we don't know why Saul decided to turn on them to, as the passage says, seek to annihilate them, a genocide. But he did. And our passage says his actions against them caused a great famine. Now, our indigenous neighbors have always warned us settlers that there is a connection between our actions and the impact on the land. Looks like it should be a part of our biblical theology as well, if we look at this. I want us to take a look and see what we can learn from this passage. Eugene Peterson, who I appreciate so much in his unpacking of the life of David, and as in his commentary on this passage, he speaks to the interconnectedness of sin and the land. He says this, It is not our habit today to account for famines and floods and epidemics of disease by tracing them to evil acts. But even if we count ourselves fortunate to know far more about meteorology and disease than our ancestors, we would do well not to be overly condescending to their sense of of the deep interconnectedness of all things. Maybe there is a more intimate interconnection between the way people live and the kind of world they live in than we commonly suppose. Fascinating. So in the midst of this famine, King David said, wow, we got to do something about this. Three years in, they're starting to get hungry. Well, maybe we should think, what can we do? How about we pray? He sought the face of the Lord. We don't know how he heard from God. We don't understand that. But we know that he did. This famine is a result of Saul's breaking the treaty and the murder of the Gibeonites. His blood-stained house, one translation says. This is not the only time God calls out his own people for their actions. I think this is really important to say. It's not just a, oh, that must have happened once to Saul. In Micah 3, we know Micah 6, 8, but in Micah 3, we read, hear this. You leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness, yet they look for the Lord's support and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. You know, some still say Israel can do no wrong. But God is clear that they can be wicked, held accountable with their bloodshed. So David, as king of Israel, takes responsibility. We have to give him that. He invites the remaining Gibeonites and asks, What shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement? And the Gibeonites answer him, Well, we have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family, nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. 
And the Hebrew's a little tricky here. Another way it could be said is, it is not money and gold that Saul and his house owed to us. And there is no man for us to kill in Israel. So are they saying they can't put anyone in Israel to death, but they could outside Israel? And they don't have someone to kill from Israel, and they would like it very much. In any case, David, just ask them simply, what do you want me to do for you? And you might think, well, isn't that, isn't that just really nice of him to ask? But I think David knows what they're getting at. And he falls to temptation here, knowing that what they might ask for is what they sure enough do. Asking for seven descendants of Saul, for them to be put to death. Maybe. Maybe he's thinking, great, no potential threats to my throne. Hey, eh? Quick way to just weed them out. Now we understand, remember, David started this process by listening and seeking the face of God. And at this point, he does not turn back to God in prayer. It might have been a good thing to do, David. Searching for perhaps a creative, compassionate response to this situation. I would say, I bet you if he asked Rizpah, the mother of two of the men offered, she would have had some good ideas. She's introduced in the larger story way back in 2 Samuel 3 as one of Saul's concubines. And when Saul dies, Abner, the commander of his army, takes her as his own. She had no voice. No choice in the matter. She's a trophy, a prize to be taken, like women often were, sometimes still are. But God has much more in mind for Rizpah than that. She sees the indignity of her sons impaled, and she will not stand by. She goes out and ensures the bodies are undisturbed by day and night. She was risking assault, even imprisonment from David and the Gibeonites for stepping in like this. This is their thing. What right does she have to come out there and make a mess of it? The passage here says that she was there from the beginning of the harvest, until the rains would come. This could easily have been weeks, maybe even months, where she makes a little lean-to out of this sackcloth and then day and night protects these bodies. And it's her vigil, her willingness to stand up, her silent protest that speaks volumes. Not only... Were the Gibeonite deaths wrong? Yes, they were. These deaths are also wrong. And when David hears about what she's doing, he eventually realizes the need to act. The passage is clear. The land was not healed. Things were not made right after David responded to their request after the death of these men. It fulfilled the Gibeonites' request, but this was not the way to bring healing. When David humbles himself, sees the example of this throwaway woman whose life speaks volumes, collects their bodies, as well as the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan, and he gives them all a proper burial. Verse 14 says, after that, God answered prayer in behalf of the land. Now, there's some deep things we could pull out of this story. One, of course, is how we live affects the land, our world. God's good creation. It's very important in what our kids have been learning in Sunday school. The greater lesson, of course, here is that we are responsible. 
and able to bring healing to the past, even if it wasn't our wrongdoing, but those who came before us that caused pain, trauma, and death. It's made clear to David that a wrong has been done in the past. From a treaty that was how long? How long ago? 400 years. What does that matter? <sighs> right? That's way in the past. And yet, David realizes he has a role in bringing about the healing of what's wrong. So how do we live this truth out today? I think there's no clearer example of this than the pain that has been caused for Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis here in our country. Most often directly at the hands of Christians who have gone before us and continue, continues to happen without others standing up for the rights and justice for all. Now, I know in the past few years, there have been some strides being made forward. And some of our Christian brothers and sisters have been praying and working for these rights and justices for decades. And any strides being made on a national level are answers to prayer for this, based out of Scripture. And they and their, their call from God. And I know that many of you have given much from your lives, loving and caring for many from Indigenous backgrounds. And I acknowledge that as well. For many of us, we're just finally learning some of the truths of our history. I had the privilege of meeting with the OKIB Council when we first started our reconciliation weekends about six years ago. And I felt really confident in my knowledge. I'd studied and done quite a bit, and I was eager to, let's do reconciliation. And I was there, and one council member asked me if I knew what the royal proclamation was. And I had to admit, I had no clue. And he gently invited me to read up on our history. The Royal Proclamation. This goes way back, 1763. Don't worry, kids, I didn't put it into a rap. I'm not going to try to Alexander Hamilton this. It's the Royal Declaration on which our country was founded under the British monarchy. And it states very clearly that the Western lands are reserved... And by Western lands, that's anything west of partway through Ontario. Are reserved as exclusive hunting grounds for the several nations or tribes of Indians. That they were under royal protection. And the proclamation set out, you can't just go out there and take any land. There is a process where indigenous nations could sell their lands to representatives of the British monarchy if they so freely chose to. And this could only take place in public meetings, especially for this reason, to ensure that it was a fair process, that there wasn't any, any sideways things going on, a constitutional basis for all future negotiations of indigenous treaties in British North America. That's the Royal Proclamation. And many, and many say, our indigenous people lost the war. Well, what war? The truth is, they invited us to share in the land that no one owns, but that we all access with open hearts, with open homes, to steward it with them. And we promised that we would do so fairly with justice. Now, many treaties were formed throughout much of Canada. 
with First Nations ceding their land to Canada, to the government, under specific agreements. And for much of our country, we have to wrestle with the fact that they are all treaty people and understand what agreements were made, what has been broken, and if they will be just as they figure out how to make it right. Now, what's unique about us in B.C., and you might know this, in B.C., most of our province was never ceded. There were no treaties or agreements with the local First Nations. Our settler forebears decided not to abide by the proclamation. Instead, with the colonial mindset and the doctrine of discovery behind them, they drove out, often tricked and abused people off the land that we wanted as settlers. Instead of abiding by the proclamation in 1876, we created the Indian Act, controlling, dehumanizing Indigenous peoples. Now you might say, oh, 1876, that's long ago. 1763, that's even longer ago, Pastor. Does this royal thingy even apply anymore? Well, in 1973... That's not so long ago. It was a good year. My wife was born in that year. Supreme Court Judge Emmett Hall found that the basic principles, I'm sorry, basic principles of the Royal Proclamation were generally applicable in British Columbia, where the majority of land remains unceded by treaty. The implications of the decision are that indigenous land rights are legally enforceable over other large areas of the country. So there's work to be done to figure out, whoa, what went wrong? Why didn't we? And even land, even here in Vernon, land that was set aside, we decided, well, you know what, that's too much. That's too much for your reserve. We're going to cut it way back. Because we like this. The indigenous people of our land welcomed us with open arms, open homes, open hearts. Now, if you have the privilege to have an indigenous friend, you might be surprised by any of this, stating how kind and open hearted and loving they still are. And it amazes me how resilient our neighbors have been through all this, making the best of situations. Yet, more and more are willing to speak the truth of their experience on their land, in schools, in work, ongoing prejudice and discrimination. And they call us to respond. Not to offer up our sons, like David did, but to respond to their calls to action, to be willing to engage the hard truth of our history and begin the long journey of reconciliation. So I mentioned Chief Dr. Robert Joseph earlier. Look at his face. He's no Gibeonite asking for lives. No, but a shared life together. Listen to what he says. Reconciliation includes anyone with an open mind and an open heart who is willing to look into the future with a new way. And even if we don't want to take ownership and responsibility for what those who have gone before us have done, which we have ample biblical precedent to do, Even if we don't want to do that, Scripture is clear. We are to take care of those near us who are struggling, marginalized, oppressed. That we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Someone said that once. Someone important. Now we see this written in the Psalms. Psalms 146. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. And we see it in the prophets as well. 
Isaiah 58. Is this, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? If you do away with the yoke of oppression, Isaiah continues, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. You will be like a well-watered garden, like the spring whose waters never fail. We like that last verse. We don't necessarily pair it with the rest of it very often. The passage goes on to say, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. So I have some good friends who have been working hard, longing and praying for the rebuilding that has been happening in our country. For the 94 calls to action to be recognized by our government and to see us begin to respond to them. To see the United Nations declare the rights of indigenous peoples, known as UNDRIP. For each country, province, and organization to be called to respond to them. Will we stand up for everyone's rights? Remember, Chief Dr. Robert Joseph asked Jody, what will Baptists do? So what will we do? Well, first, let me show you just a couple things briefly of what our family of churches, how they've responded so far. This is from the CBWC website. In 2015, Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission released 94 calls to action to various stakeholders. And those actions are meant to continue the process of healing and reconciliation which the truth-telling at the TRC began. On Saturday, May 25th, 2017, how many years ago was that? Seven years ago already. The Canadian Baptists of Western Canada voted to do just that. Use UNDRIP as a framework for reconciliation. For CBWC churches to adopt these rights as a framework for reconciliation means that we agree these rights ought to be realized by the indigenous people in our region. As CBWC churches throughout Western Canada engage with our indigenous neighbors, we commit to acknowledge and support these rights, to respect inherent rights that have hereto been denied. It encourages us to subvert and reverse the suppression of indigenous culture, which has been our strategy for so long, by supporting indigenous communities' efforts to be strengthened and healed. One, one uh, gentleman, and I connected with him this last week, Mike Deal, he's the delegate from Willow Lake Baptist Church in Winnipeg at that assembly. In 2017. And as they were wrestling with this motion, they were deliberating, would we vote this in? Would we do this? He said, I am part of the privileged. One of the privileges, no, no, not, not this one yet. One of the privilege I have is that I am unaware of the extent of my privilege. The system is set up to work for me, for my success, for my comfort. The principles in the UN Declaration already apply to all of us. Yet I sense fear, uncertainty, and doubt from many about what this motion means to the CBWC, to our church members, and to us personally. And then he said this, If you feel uncomfortable about this motion, it probably means you are part of the privileged, that our society is set up for your comfort and success. 
And then Mike challenges us to think about people who try to live in a society that marginalizes and devalues and dehumanizes them now and for many generations past. Well, that's a lot, I know. A lot to take in. And I don't know what the famine is for our generation that will get our attention. It might be connected to the land, even the fires, the climate change. Some would say that. And who are the women like Rizpa who are taking a stand, showing us all that something must be done? I do know a few of them, and I pray we'd listen to them. I know that Jesus has softened my heart just like he softened David's and moved him. Now, I'm not calling anyone here to follow any specific political leader, <clears throat> Trudeau, or to vote a specific way. That's not what this is about. I'm not saying because Justin says it, we got to do it. No. I'm here because I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that he is offering us all abundant life. And that his view of that abundance is ensuring that others experience it. Making things right. Recognizing injustice. And joining him in seeing the oppressed set free and past rights made wrong. As opposed to trying to force you into some agenda, political or otherwise. I mean, inviting all of us into the life that Jesus offers us. Which is finding ways to love our neighbors as we love ourselves which means admitting when we haven't loved them and finding a new way forward, figuring out what it means to walk together in a good way. I'm going to invite Lisa and Patrick to come up and they're going to respond in prayer as we sit with this. Good morning. <clears throat> so I'll lead a prayer of confession and reconciliation. There'll be a moment of silence for personal reflection, then Lisa will finish. God of all peoples, in times and place, in all times and places, your creation sings your praise. Your Son teaches us the ways of love, justice, and peace. Your Spirit emboldens our hearts and hands to build the world according to your will. We confess our brokenness. We often do not hear the cries of those who are suffering because it is inconvenient and costly to respond. We do not like to acknowledge truths that make us feel uncomfortable. We reject and belittle those who are different than we are. We are blind to the ways we benefit today from a legacy of hurt against Indigenous people. Too often, we love imperfectly, speak harshly, and judge quickly. Reconciling God, we are called to gentleness, to compassion, and to radical acceptance of difference. In Jesus Christ, we are learning to walk in new ways with new companions. We are learning to surrender to the need of just surrender the need to justify, to explain, and to fix. We are learning to listen. When creation groans, we groan as well. When your people speak out against injustice, we honor their courage to, and stand with them. Spirit of God, create us in us feeling hearts, clear eyes, and open minds. Amen. <clears throat> 